Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how such a problem can be addressed. Uh, so how should we even start thinking about representing a complex mapping like this one, uh, which was one of the examples that uh, uh, Tiffany uh, provided to us. So all of you know, the main kind of most important thing about SESAM so that it scales across like sharing um, uh, with uh, or including many different uh, people, many different use cases. And one of the biggest issues is we need something simple so that any group can adopt the standard. And it is in essence very simple. So if, when you look at SESAM, you will find a lot of things, statements like this, where you um, have like a single the concept is mapped to a single other concept. Uh, and uh, also, we have this requirement. No, ah, Zoom says they don't have a visual. You can conf uh, confirm when they have, and then I will continue. Um, no, I'm on Zoom now. I can't see anything. It's just a great gray screen. Okay. So. Yeah, we will wait for for it to be shared. Everybody should disconnect and reconnect. Yeah. Spaceship technology in here. Don't worry. They will. <laughs> <laughs> Samantha will sort it. <coughs> You see anything? Oh, yeah, we're back. Excellent. All right. So uh, one of the key requirements of the current SESAM uh, profile list is that both the subject and the object ID should be modeled as entity references, like, like you could say identifiers, basically. Uh, and the question is, if that is a requirement, how can we represent something like this as an identifier? Because we are not going to kind of um, represent, we are not going to be able to build arbitrary complex data structures to represent this thing. Like anyone here could build a complex model to represent this, but we want something that fits inside of the kind of simple framework of SESAM. So basically, we started thinking, okay, what can we do to represent something like this? So the first one is, you, that's what we call it attempt zero, is we just say we accept the loss uh, and we say okay, we have a complex expression, what we can do is we can map to the parts of it that are, uh, that are critical using our normal kind of uh, mapping vocabulary. So you can see here a broad match, uh, there are basically two broad match uh, statements that can reflect the, um, uh, a part of this mapping uh, uh, separately. And there are many use cases out there that for which this would be totally sufficient actually uh, as a form of representation. We don't need to do anything. We are done and we are happy. So we don't, uh, that's, uh, that's great. But the problem is uh, obviously we have lost a lot of the semantics in this expression. We, only, we can only use broad matches. We can never use a precise mapping this way. And uh, we've, yeah, and basically this led us to say, okay, it's a nice uh, thing. And for some use cases, this may be sufficient, but the truth is we do need something more. We need to represent this somehow uh, completely. Uh, and so the first initial thing that you could think is, okay, can we kind of just provide a list in our identifier saying something like this, where uh, you say uh, where all the components of the complex terms are just concatenated one after the other. And then you, you say, okay, this is great. Now we have added at least all of the component of our mappings into some, uh, into some kind of string representation. But the question is then, and that leads to, uh, to your question, Sue, from before, like what do we do with a statement like this? This is just like a string where all of the components of this um, complex mappings are just listed as a list. Uh, we can't do anything. We can't neither for, uh, translate this into an OWL expression, nor can we turn this into an SQL statement for grouping our data, no, we, nor can we do anything else with it. So we said, okay, this is not also covering what we really want here. 
So the next go the attempt is, is to say, okay, uh, we have logical languages, we have OWL, we have other logical languages as well that where we can represent logical statements in some kind of string form. Uh, so we can basically what we do is, is we just write some kind of long logical expression where you have like the where, where you have everything like the the Pato term modifies the HP term and the Pato modifies uh, HP again. So you have like a big expression and you can say this is great. This is somehow doing what we want. But when you look at this, you're like Okay, first of all, uh, it's ugly. Uh, so there's a lot of like fluff in this expression that seems uh, annoying, like the pers this, like these escaped characters that we need because of the fact that all of our entities need to be represented as an entity reference, or for those of you that haven't worked with this, basically a URI. Um, so and you're like, ah, okay, this is this seems uh, inconvenient, and also. Uh, what do we do when we want uh, to use another language? And uh, so this seems not really uh, very scalable. And how do we deal with that? Is there a parser? Is there some kind of framework that we can use to parse this expression? So then we went to the next level and said, okay, let's st use a standardized expression from one of our languages, which is OWL in this case, and just use it um, and use that as, a, as an expression to represent everything. Okay, so when you get to this pure piece of beauty here that is like a huge statement that has all of the um, cement like basically a it's basically a huge logical expression constructed so if you would uh, had the time to read what this is you could in theory just use a standardized owl parser and read this uh, back into an owl class expression with the owl api and then do something with that but then we are losing a lot of people here already. Like most of the people that are dealing with mappings, they will be like, oh, I don't really care about OWL. I just want something simple. I want some simple JSON or something like that. And again, we haven't served all of these uh, people. And of course, it's super complex, error prone and ugly, these kinds of things. So when then we started thinking, okay, maybe we can somehow embed the some kind of templating or um, schema system here in, uh, in and put it somewhere behind in the same metadata model uh, so here instead of just having an expression uh, that looks like similar to attempt number one where you have up top um, here this uh, relatively simple looking list and then you also embed a template uh, that has this owl class expression somewhere there and then you have some slots in this our uh, in this owl class expression and we've just put this for example in the header of our mapping set or something like that and we can use it like that so at least we get a good um, nicer looking uh, entity expression here but um, and we can swap out our templates to whatever other templating system we need or schema system or, or whatever depending on our use cases but the problem is now like, is this really maintainable? Let's say 10 people here in this audience publish ma mapping sets out there, they put this template string in there and then suddenly uh, someone obsoletes, uh, I don't know, like an RO relation that is used in this template. We are basically reinventing ontology design here. And what needs to happen then, people need to go open their mapping sets, fixing every single mapping set out there that is using a template like that. And uh, this is really like, you know, basically saying, let's build an ontology with SESM. So that's not really ideal of uh, what we want. And um, you know, even if we go one step further and say, okay, we can, uh, we can extend this, we can say, uh, we can add another field and saying, uh, what kind of language is this used in? Like, uh, wh what kind of language is our template in? Like in OWL, is it an order template? Is it some kind of DOSDP expression, a JSON schema or something like that? Even then, we're still at this point, like, is this really maintainable? And we're going to need a lot of tooling to deal with this moving forward. All right, so now let's um, move to the kind of idea that we are hoping to um, establish one way or another that could deal with this problem a bit better. The pro the, we just call it for now externalized entity expression templates, and the idea is uh, so you, we are going back to something that looks a little bit like what we had in the first slides. So it's uh, you have a um, it's a bit annoying that anyways. so you have a um, uh, a piece here up front 
that identifies something. In this case, uh, we will talk about what this is in a bit. And then you have all the components of, uh, of, this, um, of this mapping listed afterwards here. Right? It looks okay, you don't know what it means yet. Um, it looks si similar to what we had in the beginning, but the, I uh, the idea is this. You basi we basically define something like, a, uh, a, like an uh, expression syntax that just allows us to select or identify a sort of template. Uh, so, for example, when we try to implement something like what you asked, Sue, before, it would be something like a, temp a DOSDP template, for example, or a template that describes EQ expressions. So this thing here is what, th that here is basically something like a pattern library, for example, for those that know uh, Ufino or Go, uh, you would have like a registry of uh, patterns there. This identifies a single pattern inside of that registry, and then you define the, um, uh, the uh, components, so the actual uh, entities that are part, that should be instantiated using this thing here, uh, as a, um, a URI uh, parameter string. Okay, so this is the full post-coordinated concept uh, as a URI parameter string. So what can we do now with this? So the idea is, SESM doesn't know anything of what to do, how to deal with this at all. Uh, so we just have an entity expression that looks a little bit like this in our SESM file to define, let's say, a, um, a complex expression. And then when, some, when a client reads this, they can go and use this registry system here and dereference it and figure out and get something back from there. So for example, they can say, uh, um, I'm just going to stop uh, pointing now, but they can say that... Um, uh, that give me, for example, an instantiation of uh, this pattern using the DOSDP system or giving uh, or something like uh, give me an instantiation of this expression using a simple JSON schema or something like that. And we will look at some examples in a second. But the idea is we decouple mappings um, completely from the sort of representation of the post-coordinated concepts and, the, and its meaning and we document those in a separate space. So basically, like a, think of it as like a library of uh, templates, a library of schemas, a library of design patterns. So now we can do these things that, um, that uh, you've asked before also. So now we can go and instantiate, for example, this, uh, ex this expression here as a, um, an OWL class expression because our registry has, for example, implemented a way that you can say, give me, uh, you instantiate this using the, the, the DOSTP patterns that are located in this registry, and then it will give you back this kind of OWL class expression that you can then uh, pull in into your uh, analysis pipeline, uh, merge with your ontology, run the reasoner, and then uh, go and do your um, kind of analysis. And then you can do the same, you can use the same exact system for doing other cool things. So for example, you can say, uh, I want just to communicate this, the, this complex p uh, uh, pattern here to my users and I want to point this thing to a documentation page or something that just gives me a nice picture. Uh, so we can communicate here easily with like uh, our slides, but it would be super cool if you had such a complex expression, if you could just put this in the browser and you get this kind of picture back to understand what exactly is going on there in, the, in, in terms of modeling. And we have great systems now that can do these kinds of visualization and these could be also embedded in, as part of this uh, system. And similarly, um, you, I, get, I think you get the picture now, but you could get like a simple JSON uh, instance of this uh, expression back and do whatever you want with that, even constructing a uh, a uh, SQL query or whatever. So that is kind of like the, the um, basic sort of idea of this proposal. All right, there are some open problems. Um, for example, uh, there's right now among even the development team, there's a bit of a disagreement of how exactly these expressions should be represented. So there's uh, one group that prefers something like this here because it's a bit more terse and another group that would like to have all of the, um, uh, the slots of the model represented explicitly, so disease 1, modifier 1, disease 2, modifier 2. 
Um, and I think maybe this uh, we should discuss this later in the pub exactly how we uh, solve this uh, because probably this is a difficult one to solve in, in an open discussion now. Uh, and there's also this issue of exactly how we want to um, res how we want to represent this kind of like notion of model like how do we represent this part of the query that looks up um, the system like is it a visualization that you want is it an instance of a schema is it uh, an owl class expression so there's a little bit of discussion about that but yeah so this is uh, this is uh, this is basically the proposal and um, are there any questions or any any comments about this proposal? Do you have any specific concerns? So then there, the Deepak, and uh, you check uh, James if there's anything online. Let's let's do Deepak first. One moment. We Can you hear me? Oh, good. I'll be quick. This is more of a suggestion, um, based on what I've understood so far. Um, the query parameters are highly dependent on the template and which query parameters and the position and Q1, Q2, Q3, what they mean. Then you also need to take into account the version and that has to be part of your expression because if the version or, or the template changes even slightly, your interpretation changes dramatically and that'll put people off, especially over time. It's fine when you start off, but over time, uh, a template that was written five years ago might be different, and any expression written then will have a different meaning after that. So yeah, just to keep in mind, but we can brainstorm. This is a very, very great comment, and I, to be honest, yeah, versioning, we didn't really explicitly think this through, so it's a very good point, and uh, we do need to keep track of it somehow, so add it also to the list later when you give, uh, when we are asking you for what's missing here, so thank you. We've got a couple of questions from Zoom here. Um, so the first one is from uh, Sean Tan. Um, and he says, really cool. Uh, how federated do you see the patterns, template, and schemas being? Do you see a central repository or users can maintain their own libraries? Yeah, it's an excellent uh, question and one that has already some contention within our small developer group. So uh, I am very much an advocate of decentralizing everything. So I'm like, I don't like this idea of like creating central resources that everyone then depends on. And when something fun funding runs out, like everyone's like, oh, what do I do now? Uh, but it is true that in this case, especially when we are coordinating patterns for like a wider community, for example, let's say everything related to obo ontologies or something uh, like that, or uh, then it is, definitely for of an advantage if we had a central place for those. So I think it's a case-by-case -case basis uh, question to make that discussion, but it's, it is a very important question to solve, I agree. So the next one's from Philip who says, if the namespace prefix is resolvable via some meta registry like via registry, then it could be very decentral. Oh no, that's actually a response to <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, Chris says, uh, to add to Sean's question, how would they be curated? So to add to Sean's question? To add to, to Sean's question about the decentralized repositories, he said, how would they be curated? Yeah, so th the there again, there's again two, I guess, big problems. So one is, is who is going to provide, let's say even in a single registry, who's going to uh, basically put, let's say, the Dusty P patterns, the author templates, the visualization uh, um, systems and stuff like that into this repository. But I agree, so this is the typical problem of uh, community coordination and um, uh, how do we agree on who's deciding which, you know, it, which exact temp, which exact instantiation is returned by which exact expression. But on the, uh, so like if we are talking about the decentralized question, so yeah, I guess uh, everyone can just put their own templates uh, or schema expressions in their own repository. And if someone wants to use it, they will just refer to it and say, this is the one that I use. I use, let's say, um, James's registry to, uh, uh, that's what I, this is what I mean when I um, represent this post-coordinate ex expression. I don't know whether there's any like, you know, easy way to answer or solve that problem, but yeah, 
I'm I, sorry, I've just reread Philip's one that I disregarded because I thought it was a reply to a different question. But actually, he was he was asking um, if it's resolvable via some meta registry like the bioregistry, then it could be very decentralized because you could use the. Um, I think he means you could use the namespace prefixes yes. to know where to look. Yeah. So yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes, that would be the hope. Yes. But in, don't, don't forget also that the registry references have to be embedded in the mapping file itself. So they are part of the description of the SSSOM uh, file. So you will always know where it is located. And, you, and, I th and that's why exactly why I think a decentralized solution would be possible. But I guess, uh, yeah, we will see in practice which is better. Probably reasonably large um, registries, but not like one to rule them all. So the, the next question is, Plain Devil's Advocate, is a TSV format the right place to model something like complex mappings, etc.? Uh, is the TSV format suitable for... Sorry, say that again. Is a TSV format the right place to model something All like right. complex mappings? It is basically... It's a good question, and this is why it's always an option to say it is out of scope. But our hope is, is that... So, f first of all, complex expression mappings are super important. Uh, so, we do need to solve it in one way or another. And again, similar to what, was, what we asked before, we, need to, we, we should consider to use an existing sort of um, stream of work like SESAM to solve that problem and, um, and implement a solution before we go and say, ah, it's too complicated, let's build something entirely different that is more tailored to that problem. So, I think, um, in, so in my opinion, uh, it is suitable if we build some solution like the one that uh, that we've presented here. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm wondering about actual use cases of the complex mappings here, because I could imagine some that are in between, many useful ones that are in between understanding a whole logical expression and, uh, you know, so if you think about the ex a, a bunch of examples that had negation in them, which is hard to, to work with in AL, um, and y you could easily d have a mapping that said, um, so uh, I don't remember the exact example that you had, you know, a, a complex expression and then a mapping to something like bowel obstruction was true, uh, some other possible cause was false. So the negation there, you can say it definitely doesn't map to that, and then there were a couple of others that were true. So just as a bag, knowing which are true and false is incredibly useful. Yes. Whereas if you if you shared this string without those without at least the negation modifiers in there, I'd be terrified that m people would look at it. Okay, they can look up how to use SOM, and they can go and track the uh, you know, and they can, they can go and try and pull this thing down, and maybe they'll get some JSON that's useful. But without the negation explicitly in there, they'll just pass out the identifiers and make a mapping. So, mm -hmm. so I guess I've ended up making a statement instead of a question here. But you know, the general question here is, um, you know, can we can we get a clear set of use cases that are maybe somewhere in between? I want a super detailed logical mapping that I'm going to do some something with Al with and somehow do some integration with, versus a bunch of people out there who want to know does X map map to you know, A, B, and C, mm -hmm. and not D. Yes. Yeah, it is, a, um, it is a very good question. We did grapple with this with a predicate modifier column decision as well. And it is, so in my opinion, the, like the, it's still complex enough looking that no one should try to manually, like I feel like, uh, uh, okay, maybe I'm underestimating the situation, but I feel like people wouldn't just go and parse this string to, uh, to, you know, just assume this is just a simple conjunction, basically. What that's what, or no, this junction is what you're saying. So I, I feel like, yeah, there should be some kind of like um, maybe, some, maybe we can add some kind of like metadata to the mapping set that says like if there are complex expressions in there, you, you they are documented here or something like that, just to at least add, add some failsafe. But yeah, I don't know, like there's probably no good solution for that. Everyone can, if they think they should ha hack that string, bad, yes. 
Um, another question from Zoom. Um, Faircore for EOSC project is currently developing a mapping registry. Are you planning to collaborate with them to integrate your specific requirements? Yes, I have already reached out to some of them for the, to, in hope that I, that we can work with these uh, with the, their group. And I'll see. Like I will talk to Jan also to get more contact details. So there's the Finnish group as well, and there are some people there that uh, that actually a few people that are working on registries right now. So yes, I hope to work with them uh, to implement this. Next one is um, SCOS exact match is defined as SCOS exact match is to use to link two concepts and property symmetric and transit and transitive. So do the, does this work with complex mappings? <laughs> yeah, okay. Now we're getting into a very, uh, co like now I would have to, ho to step back a lot to answer this question, but in general, we are sort of, oops, we are glossing a little bit the fact that we are talking about, let's say, owl specific mappings here and something more like a, a SCOS terminology mapping. So we think it works, but yes, if you're consuming complex mappings and you want to do owl analysis with it, you have to also know how to use them and understand that the SCOS exact match now is not a, maybe, you know, interpreted as something else like an owl expression. So yes, I think, I think it should still work. Also this transitivity assumption, and the equivalence assumption, equiv uh, exact uh, match assumption, they should work still, yes. All right, good. So there was a lot of questions. Um, let's move um, on to the next uh, presentation. So this is, uh, let me just also, I don't know, it's, it's definitely not necessary to introduce, but with, since we've done it for everyone. So uh, uh, Chris is the department head of the Biosystems Data Science uh, Berkeley Lab at the um, LBNL. He holds a PhD in bioinformatics from the University of Edinburgh and Chris and his groups are working on the application of computational techniques to the problems of uh, relevance to the health of humans and the health of the planet and he's interested in the application of AI, knowledge-based methods and bio-curation to advance our understanding of genes and genetic um, mechanisms. So with that, thank you Chris. <laughs>